Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Rotorol Football Show. I am Patrick Darty, joined this Tuesday by Mr. Denny Carter, where we are going to break down the Eagles' shocking Monday night football loss, their ongoing slump, uh, losing streak for the defending <laughs> NFC champions. They've gone from the number one seed in the NFC to firing people every week. It's been quite yeah. a change of scenery for the Eagles. We'll talk about Ken Walker. We'll talk about Geno Smith, hoping return, hoping to return for week 16. Beyond Monday Night Football, James Cook's explosion against the Cowboys, Bajan Robinson's uh, latest dud after many, many duds. Den people are telling Denny that Bajan was the problem all along, not, <laughs> yes. not Art, Art Smith. You know, we'll break down Ty Chandler, his huge Week 15, his prospects for Week 16 – with or without Alexander Madison, the Jaguars' injury outlook as the receiver core keeps getting more and more injured. Baker Mayfield's best career start. Jake Browning, but then Jamar Chase going out for the Bengals. Steelers' QB changed. Commanders' offense and much more. Uh, but, Denny, we would be remiss if we didn't riff on the easiest topic in the world to riff on, and that is Christmas music. And it is easy. We're not going to have a contrarian take. Our audience will not be surprised. We both hate it. Uh Hate it, hate it, hate it. But uh, I have my own playlist. I did want to tell you. I didn't get to tell you this off air, Pat, but I have my own Christmas playlist of of what I it, it, the, the actually the playlist is titled "Actually Good Christmas Music." Oh well, is it all songs from The Cure in 1985? <laughs> did The Cure make a Christmas album that's really just a goth album where they say Christmas uh, in every song? No, Pat, but they should have. <laughs> they actually should. I, have. That's all I all I would be talking about. No, it's just it's just the Bowie Christmas song over and over and over. <laughs> Did you know there's a there's a very infamous from like 2009 or 10 when his voice was already fried, Bob Dylan Christmas album called Christmas in the Heart. I this is have, not this is real. I have heard that and uh, it's not not great. No, it's not. Bob Dylan had like vocal surgery or something because his voice actually hit like a nadir, and it's been better the past five or six years. But Christmas in the Heart. It was like yeah, he had, for effect, I think, actually swallowed several lumps of coal. And, uh, <laughs> he was not, committed to the Christmas he, bit. He was very committed to the Christmas bit. Uh, but you know, my the point I wanted to make is there hasn't been a new song enter the Christmas canon and pop, at least pop radio Christmas canon in 30 years, other than Michael Bublé doing like the fifth best rendition, of, like the <laughs> sixth best or sixth best Christmas songs ever. But, yeah, wow, Michael Bublé doing the. 19th best version I've ever heard of White Christmas. Uh, right. Stuff. Really Do, doing for some reason doing a seven minute Frosty the Snowman. <laughs> like, <laughs> why, why does why does Frosty the Snowman know. have to last so long? And by the way, I, I I had a soft spot for it because it has the backup singers sounding unbelievably ridiculous for a Christmas song for about a live snow a living snowman, but. The song just drags on forever, and I don't appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, I wonder if the Velvet Underground ever made a Christmas album. That'd be real good. Oh, I'm sure it wouldn't be depressing or dark at all. <laughs> no, no. I, I, the, 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 the positive Christmas thing, that's played out. It is. This is played out. You no, know, you 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 do you do get tired of the super happy Christmas stuff. Um, I will say that the formula for Christmas music over the generations really seems to be one simple thing it's i it properly identifying the time of year to say uh folks today this is christmas time and we're going to sing about it <laughs> this is this is totally normal music where they ad lib the word christmas and yeah and yeah the beatles i mean their christmas song hey jude it's it literally just hey jude where they swap out jude for christmas i thought that was a cheap catch <laughs> Right. Right. also cash 13 cash. minutes uh, and, and yeah they, and they just doubled the length of the song yeah it's just too much. Oh, th th there are some depressing uh, Christmas songs. Uh, one about one about like a mother dying. Uh, There's a lot about like dads not coming home. Yeah, and, yeah. Like, and they're but they're always very upbeat. I know Daddy left, but Santa is here. <laughs> <laughs> Love that one. <laughs> you look up. You look up the Wikipedia. This song came out in 1952, and they played this <laughs> on the radio. <laughs> that doesn't seem like something that would happen then. Yeah, and, I I recently had to explain to my daughter uh the the real meaning behind um the i saw mommy kissing santa claus Ooh, what is um, the real meaning and she actually was she actually felt better about it because she was like oh okay so mommy was being faithful you yeah, know when she yeah. was kissing santa claus because you got folks to cover your kids ears santa claus was dad <laughs> yeah so uh wow uh that is a big spoiler alert there i guess it's a good time 
to get the show started. By the way, there's I'm assuming there's an 18 minute craft work Christmas song that sounds <laughs> not holiday at all, and they just say Christmas in German. It's just it's just a jingle for 18 straight minutes, no other sound. <laughs> That's a droning jingle. I actually <laughs> the song I would ever hear on uh, Jingle Bells in Hell, my 24 hour. I made that joke somewhere recently. I think it was Galaxy Brains where I was talking about Jingle Bells in Hell. Um, I'll tell you who was in hell, Denny. Uh, <laughs> Philadelphia Eagles. They got legacy drived by Drew Locke. Mm. To be fair, it was fluky. Drew Locke tried to throw like five interceptions on this drive. My guy, Drew Locke, Mizzou alum, Drew Locke, who gave it not a bit like a touching interview after the game. Yeah. A really poignant reminder of the humanity at the center of these games. But the humanity for the Eagles is this they're supposed to be a title contender who are, they're just lost. They're they're grasping at straws. I mean, they are literally firing people. They're, everyone's banged up. Jalen Hurts and the knee injury, I feel like, probably taking more and more of a weekly toll. Uh, we've been worried for a while now. I mean, how worried are we about this Eagles offense after they go into Seattle against not a bad Seahawks defense, but the kind of defense a team like the Eagles should be putting up a lot of points on, and it's not doing it? How concerned are we about the Eagles and their ongoing offensive struggles? It's concerning. I I, I expected the Eagles to have success on the ground against the Seattle defense that has been among the two or three worst rush defenses in the league for going on two months now. I mean, this is not a new thing. Like teams have gashed the Seahawks on the ground. The Eagles ground game uh, is not, not working. So this idea and, and the coaches have talked about, it. I know fans, Eagles fans have talked about it a lot. We, we got to establish it. We just got to get back to the run. I think that's that's completely wrong. I know you'll be shocked to hear this. But I, I think it's completely wrong. I think that the the they have to adjust to the fact that their defense now can't really stop anybody, including Drew Locke in the fourth with with a minute to thirty to go in the fourth quarter. And it was and less have, than that, by the way. It was like right. a minute five. <laughs> and they have to adjust to that new reality and and be more aggressive and be more passive. Pet, they're five percent under their expected dropback rate in this three game losing streak. It. It is not that they are uh, going pass heavy. Okay, they are. They're not like they're 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 actually going very run heavy, very conservative. I think last night they they clearly had the mindset. The Eagles had the mindset. We're we're just not going to lose. We're ju we're just going to hope that Drew Locke is Drew Locke and messes this up for the Seahawks, and we're going to sneak out of here with a with a victory. Okay, that that and that's not that's not the mindset to have. Like you you got to be aggressive, and they have not been aggressive. They've been afraid. I would say offensively. I would not have guessed that pass rate over expected stat. That's pretty surprising. Even though I knew they had been going run heavier, I just don't understand. So, like, if you look at their run stats from last night, they're good. 38 carries, 178 yards, 1382 of that being Jalen Hurts. But, like, why a team that can just totally road pay people on the ground when they really want to over the past season, why they don't have, like, a true power running back? Like, why was DeAndre Swift, Kenneth Gainwell, and Rashad Penny that they should – this is one team that should have like a genuine power running back, like the actually good AJ Dillon. Yeah. Know, like if they, because they're so their their calling card has been their versatility. Why not have a power running back for when the passing attack is either struggling or they don't have faith in it? Because I feel like it would have worked better last night if it was a genuine downhill power rushing attack. But it wasn't that. It was a lot of QB runs and DeAndre Swift, who is just not a power runner. Well, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with this. It's no, 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 Pat, you're right. They do, and they do. They have the answer. I'm not. I'm not being sarcastic here they have and it's Rashad Penny I know I was thinking about that this morning I just I wonder if he's just physically cooked because it certainly seemed like the kind of game or this is the mentality they want to take he's the ultimate rhythm momentum runner why would this have not been a 20 carry Rashad Penny game I, yes he doesn't have 20 carries all season and revenge there was revenge no, in the in no. the mix you know man he might be physically cooked is my guess with Rashad Penny this isn't that complex of a scheme I'm pretty sure he can <laughs> run the ball in it and uh but we are concerned who are the eagles playing this week i wish i had known this off the top of my head they're playing the new york football giants then they're playing the arizona cardinals then they're playing the giants again somehow so they should have some momentum going into the playoffs you got three wins but they yeah they are in trouble i hate i hate to say it they are i don't understand how their defense is this bad like can anyone explain this to me the people who like watch film uh, like, injuries. Everyone knew they were going to regress. Like that was a that was a summer talking point. The Eagles' pass defense was going to regress, but I don't think anyone thought they'd be like the two or three worst pass defenses in the NFL. It, I mean, they're they're hugely banged up in the in the secondary, and they're getting no pressure either. I, I know. 
Yeah, and especially against against the slot and in the middle of the field, they're just they're just getting wrecked. So it, it's uh, it's been tough. It's been tough for them. And and you know, Drew even Drew Locke could look could look decent uh, so against them. I, I will say Drew Locke did the, did the thing that you that you've written about where he said I'm going to throw the ball far to my yeah. best pass catcher and hopefully he can do something with it. And that and it worked. Like DK Metcalf came down with that critical jump ball between two defenders. I think quarterbacks should try that more often. People need to realize there's more to efficiency than just six to seven yard passes and completing 72% of your throws. And then there's a reason John Elway only completed like 53% of his passes, but is in the hall of fame. It's because yeah. he made, he made big plays. He quote created offense and that maybe we've gone too far. No one wants to see it. Like, like Terry Bradshaw, like 46% completion percentage. No. But I mean, gosh, like enough with the seventy percent stuff. Take some shots. Well, it's it's the same. Yeah, I mean, it's the same. It's sort of the same thing in, in, in basketball. Right? Oh yeah, Where, yeah. I, it, don't get us started. As as much as I am an analytics guy, obviously analytics has ruined sports. It has. It kidding aside, and we, we're not faulting anyone because you have no. to follow the analytics once. Analytics is the classic thing. Like once you learn it, you can't unlearn it. That's There's right. The reason why in baseball you do you did the shift, it's because once you have that knowledge, you'd be stupid not right. to employ it. But it makes the game uh, unwatchable. As a species, we've become too smart. We have. Um, we've optimized and, everything. And 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 the optimization of sports has largely ruined the viewing experience. It has, but that's fine. I mean, We're still watching anyway. Except for I should say, the exception is uh, Sunday night football. And <laughs> And, and the exception is, of course, every NFL game that we still watch. <laughs> but, then on the other side of the ball, Kenneth Walker retook over 22 touches, 19 carries, 86 yards. Zach Charbonnet, I think, had like four or five touches. I don't know what was going on with the like, pretty unnecessary committee. That Zach Charbonnet, I have to say, I, I don't like to call anyone overrated. He's also a rookie. He's learning the game. But, man, like Zach Charbonnet, I feel like gets a lot of pub. When he like it was that one linebacker, he just kept drilling over and over and over, <laughs> in the pre-season? over again. Yeah, was it in the pre-season? Pre-season? <laughs> and, and there was there was a few times in the regular season where he drilled uh, the guy, but there's always like 2.9 yards per carry. And Kenneth Walker being way better, is this enough to call Kenneth Walker back in control of the Seahawks backfield heading into Week 16? Um, yes, I guess. I mean, Kenneth Walker probably had just like pound for pound his best game as a pro. <laughs> last night like from an efficiency standpoint like yards after contact per rush was off the charts um he you know the the way that he runs and like always trying to create a big play it, it's going to lead to some frustrating you know individual rushes and and, and gains but when and it hits, injuries right when it hits it hits I, I i think it's been clear that he's he's the superior option um do I think it matters a whole lot? I, I I don't I don't think it does. I think that I think that PD, old PD is just committed to that two back thing and his tough, tough runner and Charbonnet who's just who will literally find a defender to run into and and Pete Carroll likes that. So we can't do anything about that. Has anyone ever been committed to more bits than Pete Carroll? Yeah, Wait, he's he's a bit you, did you know that one of his bits, did you see the stat they kept showing during the game? Is that as coach of the Seahawks, he's never lost to the Eagles. <laughs> so, like, they've been good that entire time. It was the tail end of Andy Reid. It was Doug Peterson. And now it's Nick Sirianni. Like, the Eagles had, like, probably two losing seasons that entire time. And they can't beat old Pete. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, right. Just to get into Walker's performance real quick uh, against the Eagles. Uh, three runs of, of 10 or more yards on 19 19- uh, 19 carries, um, 86 yards uh, at almost five yards a clip uh, or a, a, a carry. So that was he was he was really solid. I, I think you can probably start him with confidence going going forward uh, against. I guess they're playing playing the, the Titans, Titans on Christmas yeah. Eve. Yeah, yeah, next week. Uh, there was something. I, oh, 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 I I speaking of analytics, I I do want to credit folks on my timeline who said uh, Pete Carroll did the right thing by ignoring the analytics last night on a fourth down call because quote it was raining <laughs> and, and analytics has never heard of rain you throw the math out when there's <laughs> water falling from the sky none of that stuff's factored in i'm sure don't not i know i know you're gonna tweet at me and tell me it's factored in and <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> and that it's very easily factored in oh yeah all right whatever right uh, 
no, we're, we're, let's move on because that's just dumb. Uh, real quick, Geno Smith, then he so you praise heaping praise on Drew Locke. Is that a fair characterization of what you were saying about Drew Locke? Um, uh, I'm, I'm yeah, saying this I mean, because Geno Smith seems like he's due back for week 16. Yeah, well, he'll yeah, he'll be back uh, <laughs> from the groin injury. Uh, he's, he's supposed to practice all week. It, he, and it was a close call, apparently agonizing, as Pete Carroll said, uh, agonizing call. That was because, another great Pete bit. Yeah, well, it was. Oh, oh, how much did he love not oh. not having to declare a starting quarterback? Like yeah, he did. That was that, the highlight of his career. That's great. I, I personally, I loved that as someone who made some lineups last night. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, Gino should be back, and it's a good, it's a good matchup. You know, if if he's a full health, uh, Gino is in play. The last time Gino played, he destroyed the Cowboys and was the QB one overall. And then he got hurt in practice somehow. I, mean, I saw someone tweet by so they had the Thursday night game, meaning they had the mini buy ten days off. And someone tweeted, "Only the Seahawks could get more injured during the <laughs> mini bye week." <laughs> so, it is amazing. Uh, it is amazing. Gino's back. But Gino, real quick, he's returning to one of the deepest receiver cores in the NFL. Has there been any movement between JSN and Tyler Lockett? Is JSN ahead of Tyler Lockett or not really? Tyler Lockett, I believe, had nine targets this night. JSN had the big touchdown. JSN yeah. seems like his floor and ceiling are exactly the same right now. It's hard. I mean, JSN is is running a good number of, of routes. You know, last night he ran uh, 29 of, th- of 35 routes, uh, whereas Lockett ran 33. You know, so there's not not a whole lot of difference there. Lockett, what I'm looking at here, had eight targets to four for Jackson Smith and Jigba. Um, I mean, Lockett's running super cold. I'm actually writing about him in the regression files. Uh, just, you know, not not cashing in on anything. Targets, air yards, running cold. Uh, Jason's running a little hot, especially after that touchdown catch last night. I, I, I don't know if I'm ready to say Jason is, is a better option than, than Lockett. Yeah, I agree. I don't think that's the case. He, Tyler Lockett was just not on the same page with Drew Locke. They were seemed like inches away from having like a 150 yard game, and the throws yes. just weren't accurate enough. That's right. Yeah, no, Lock, Lockett. <laughs> that looked like a Lockett game last night. You know, just, just the, uh, he was he was open on uh, some crossing routes and some downfield uh, shots, and uh, real close, but no cigar. No cigar. There will be plenty of cigars when we come back right after this. This holiday season, get the fantasy fan in your life, the exclusive Roto-World Draft Guide bundle featuring expert analytics, player insights, and season-long tools. Get all three of the draft guides for one low price. Go to NBCSports.com slash holiday bundle and use promo code HOLIDAY23 at checkout to receive 25% off and a $10 Fanatics gift card. Denny, I'm helping to edit the baseball draft guide. Where are you? Where are you for that? Where, where am I going to be for editing the baseball draft yeah, guide? I'm going to be helping so I, I'm going to be learning that uh, Shohei Otani is not pitching this year. He's not. No, he tore his elbow ligament yet again. What, so he okay. So there's a lot the, going on there. He's not pitching. Yeah, um, his his contract's basically money laundering. Um, you have to be yeah. a CPA to understand his contract. He's going to get. He's going to get like close to a billion dollars to be like this generation's Babe Ruth and he's not going to pitch. That's what or I'm he's saying. not actually getting a billion dollars either. It was 700 million, but it's worth only 460 million in like real terms or something. Cause it's all deferred. Uh, I'm not even kidding. I had to have my CPA brother-in-law explain money to me. On this one. <laughs> how does money I, work? I should call, I should call your, your yeah. brother-in-law. Cause I would, I would like to know how money works as well. Well, See here, son, this is a dollar. This is called a green back. Um, <laughs> Dollar George Washington's on it. All right, I'm taking notes, right. and I, I just write money and underline it. Money is green. <laughs> yes, money is green. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, I was shocked. I was like, hold up, wait, wait, wait. What? This yeah, guy, yeah. this guy's going to DH. Not going to play a position, right? Uh, no, he doesn't play a position. He could, but they don't want him to get hurt. He also forces you to have a six man rotation so, when he does pitch. I'm sorry. This is. This- you it's a bad it. it's a bad deal. This is it's a bad, a bad deal. deal waiting to happen. People don't want to say it. I have actually I'm calling it. it. This is a horrible deal for the Dodgers. Horrible. I've dabbled, I've dabbled in it a, on Twitter. This is a franchise. I'm gonna say because I'm not in baseball. I'm gonna say it. Franchise killer. It Back will up. be for the next ownership group because 680 million of the dollars are deferred. So everyone's saying, oh, that'll sell the team in 10 years. Otani, Otani's finished. That's it. Otani's finished. Uh, we are not finished. We are just getting started. James Cook, the RB1. 
for week 15, 25 carries, 179 yards, I believe a touchdown. Only a few catches, but he has been catching more balls since Joe Brady took over for Ken Dorsey. Uh, as, as you pointed out on Twitter very kindly, uh, it's my article, uh, quite quite an innovation by the Bills to start using their best running back a lot. Ugh. And uh, it's, they finally it's, did it. They Yeah, and they got a Dalvin Cook game out of him. Just what are your actually, thoughts on James Cook? We were joking about this in September. We said, well, we were going to have to wait till December for the Bills to commit to James <laughs> yeah. Cook. Yes, yes, and, that's the thing. And then it actually happened because this is what they did with Devin Singletary in 2021 and 2022 is they were like, uh, we don't know about Singletary. We're going to try Zach Moss. We're going to try whatever other washed running back we have on the roster. And then and then it was like, oh, yeah, okay, well, we obviously we're going to give 23 carries to Devin Singletary <laughs> every game. And the offense was way better. And, and they did the exact same thing with James Cook. It's crazy that Latavius Murray, that they were – Latavius curious as recently as like Thanksgiving. Yes. It doesn't make any sense. And finally, Oh, Hey, they committed. And, and I don't know. Look, the, I do want to point this out. They had a drop back rate of under 30% against the Cowboys. Wow. So I, I, obviously that's not going to hold, but it could be a sign of the bills being like, look, if we're going to, if we can run it, we're just going to run it. And it's a big concern for Josh Allen managers for week 16 because they're two touchdown favorites for a road game. You know, they're in LA. They don't want to be there. It's Christmas weekend. This is the ultimate like get in and get out game for the Bills. I do feel like they're going to run 30 to 35 times against the Chargers. And the Chargers don't want to be there either. Like the no. season is totally, totally nuked. Just there's never been a season that's more over than the Chargers is right now. <laughs> Every everything sets up for like 19 Josh Allen pass attempts in this game. It would be like almost shocking if he had to pass over 20 times. And I, so you're you're out here. The outs for Allen are, are minimal. The out here is that he gets a, a tush push touchdown. <laughs> like that, they, like that's your out. <laughs> no, he doesn't. You know, he doesn't do the touch. But this will be. They're winning seventeen to nothing, and for some reason, they do expose him to a bunch of dangerous hits on a quarterback <laughs> run from the seven yard line, and he converts. Right. He gets flipped over, but he doesn't go in the blue ten. He's fine. Yeah, there you go. That will happen. That will save the day for fantasy managers. But I am concerned about Josh Allen this week. But I mean, James Cook, every game it had been like strictly twelve to fifteen carries, never any fewer. Definitely never any more. Uh, but I don't think this genie is going to go back in the bottle. I mean, it's too easy, but seriously, 25 carries for 179 yards. That's what Dalvin Cook would do, like, in his three or four good games a year. Right. Like, Dalvin Cook, he'd always be highly questionable with a shoulder injury, and then he'd have rushed for 198 yards and have 42 receiving yards. And that's what James Cook did against the Cowboys, one of the best teams in the league. I, I did want to point out that um, Buffalo has been very run heavy in the red zone uh, over the second half of the season. A lot of that does include the quarterback. Right. No, no, it does. It does. And, and it, so Allen, what I mean is Allen can still get there because he's part of that rushing attack. But it, it really is uh, quite unfortunate for Stefan Diggs and Kincaid and the other, the pass catchers. Because this is the game that the Bills just straight up cannot, uh, cannot lose. Like the model will say 99.2% chance that they, they just straight up cannot lose this game. That, so they're going to mess around. It is pretty unfortunate if you've been riding Josh Allen all year because you're two touchdowns at the max, and you really, really hope one of them is on the ground from Josh yeah, Allen. That's right. I don't know. I just said two touchdowns at the max. Ain't no Connell to throw for four touchdowns against the Chargers. I mean, maybe well, maybe maybe they go stats padding mode instead of get in and get out mode. That would be nice. They definitely could. Uh, I, I, I do. I do think that. Uh, uh, you you have to start Allen and oh, yeah, 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 you know yeah. like don't get don't get tricky and start someone off the wire. No 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 no. He's still, don't get me wrong. He's still a QB one overall. <laughs> but it's that. It's, it's, yeah. So we'll get in more in depth than that on Thursday for our Week 16 preview show. We'll get more in depth all week in every format. The John Robinson. It's all anyone wants to talk about. It's all I was talking about on Sunday. Uh, just where are we at with Bijan after this latest fiasco? But, but the latest recommitment, Tyler Algier, uh, the latest Bijan lost fumble. People telling you that Bijan's the problem, that yeah. Arthur Smith's actually very good. Arthur Smith like reduced almost to tears at his press <laughs> conference. <laughs> Look, I mean, uh, he finally seems humbled. Uh, I, there's so much going on there. Where do you even begin with Bijan Robinson? Yeah. Right. So he, I know he, he had a critical fumble. Uh, Tyler Algier 
had 14 carries against Carolina to only seven for Robinson. Uh, Corderell Patterson had five, including two green zone carries, which is the most frustrating thing I've ever heard in my life. Um, and then Desmond Ritter had had four rushes. We'll get to him in a second. Look, I, I'm in a, Pat. I'm in a weird position here, an awkward position of being a Tyler Algier truther for the past three and a half months, and now having to defend Bijan Robinson. And, and, and not that I've ever, I've never actually criticized Bijan Robinson. No, like I've, 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 I've always said, you know, he's he's good. But I, I posted about Arthur Smith's hijinks, and a, a lot of some Falcons fans said, "Yeah, it's ridiculous. We need he needs to go. We need to start over this and that." So I'm not trying to paint with a broad brush, but there were quite a few folks who said Arthur Smith is not the problem. It's that Bijan Robinson is bad, and really, what's happened here, Pat, is. He had a, he had a, he had an exceptionally bad game against the Panthers, and that's it. And the rest of the season, per every stat, he has been really good. Okay, and he will be really good one day outside of the confines of Arthur Smith's offense. Someone told me that Tyler Algier is infinitely better than than uh, Bijan Robinson, and this is the same Tyler Algier who averaged three point one yards per carry against the Panthers. So I don't know. If I were an absolutely spiraling Atlanta Falcons team whose entire roster is built off the rushing attack and I had a top eight rookie running back, you would think just one of these weeks, they'd be like, no matter what, we are giving Bajan Robinson 25 carries and seeing what happens. Let's see what the Seahawks used to do with Rashad Penny, we want for us. And we know he can handle these workloads because he did it literally every single week in the Big 12. This is not a foreign concept to him. We invested all this money in him. Let's just see what happened. No, instead... They just keep losing and keep changing quarterbacks. But Taylor Heineke, Desmond Ritter is like yeah. the ultimate deck chairs on the Titanic thing. Like, like, dude, who cares? It doesn't yeah. even matter which one. You could draw – you could seriously have them do rock, paper, scissors on the field during the coin toss <laughs> for who starts, and it wouldn't make any difference. You have to see what you have in this young running back, but they're not uh, going to do it. Yeah, Tyler – I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, Taylor Heineke is not a, a huge upgrade. I think that he – uh, pro- will provide a little more uh, uh, volume, pass volume, target volume, because he doesn't doesn't really run, not nearly as much as Desmond Ritter anyway. So that that should be good for Jake London and, and yes, Kyle Pitts, who, by the way, Pat, has the second most tight end air yards on the season. Uh, um, let me see. Uh, where is my God now? <laughs> um, a note handed to me by producer Adam. Right, right. Uh, and, and so, you know, hey, look, uh, that it could be worse for them, I guess, uh, than getting Heineke back in the saddle. Could, yeah, it could be. Could also be better. <laughs> could be better. <laughs> could be. Could definitely be better. Maybe a lot better. The Atlanta Falcons are playing the Indianapolis Colts, who are really good fantasy defense. They're not quite as good in real life. They're not a bad defense, though. They create a lot of turnovers. They create a lot of havoc. They're not a good matchup for the Falcons, is I guess what I'm saying. No, the Colts will easily win this game. Bajan, where do you rank him? I wanted to intellectually, coming in to do my initial ranks, have him outside the top 24. It was not possible. I still have him in the top 20. Uh, I, I, I mean, Art Smith, I'm not even kidding. He was almost crying. Like He was chastened. I feel like he is going to commit to Bajan. Yeah, Every every once in a while, Arthur Smith requires a public humiliation. He does, then, it seems like he really does. Like, it's like, oh man, I've really done it this time. Well, I, I messed up again. <laughs> I gotta now. We gotta give the ball to Bajan, um, whose name is still Bajan. Um, so he hasn't gone back to Bijan. I thought after the big bad game, maybe it was Bijan again. I agree. We we we're we're trying to update that right now. By the way, uh, producer Adam says that the Falcons. Uh, went from uh, small underdogs to favorites <laughs> against the Colts Seems after like the move little... from Ritter to Heineke. Seems like a powerful overreaction from the bookmakers. Wow. Uh, yeah, wow. the Falcons are one point favorites. And the game is in Atlanta, uh, but my goodness gracious. Oh, I guess well, maybe... no, no one wins in Atlanta. No. <laughs> the, 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 the crowd is too, is too crazy. <laughs> The all, least intimidating road environment right. in maybe the history of sports, Atlanta. All, all 600 Saints fans who come to the uh, Falcons stadium every week for some reason. Man. Yeah, I know. They do. They really do. Even when the Saints aren't there, come there just to cause that. They're like a gang from like gangs in New York or something. <laughs> like, why do they all have handlebar mustaches and very rusty knives? I mean, the Falcons... <laughs> Mercedes Benz Stadium, whatever it is, it's one of those when you're when you're watching the game, you're like, oh, I can hear the quarterback talking in the huddle. 
<laughs> you know, you know the Falcons fans are gonna come get you now. Oh come on, they know. <laughs> so, so wow, uh, yeah, it's kind of, that you know that really is, that that is SoFi during which is the most objectionable stadium name I've ever heard in my entire life. SoFi Stadium and the Chargers. Or they have the two fans, so they have like the premium Chargers membership club. It's two fans. They get to the game early, and then all eighty-eight thousand Bills fans are allowed into the <laughs> stadium on Saturday night, exclusively on Peacock. By the way, right? All, the, all those. Uh, by the way, the two Chargers fans uh, moved to LA uh, ninety days ago. <laughs> <laughs> they did. They did. They were previously long-suffering Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> we got tired of waiting. Uh, we got we got tired of waiting for Ty Chandler uh, just dominating on Saturday. It was Thursday night. I set my lineup like I, this is actually not a joke. My entire week hinged on Ty Chandler, and he had a RB two fill in wow. start for cool. the ages. Denny Carter, twenty four carries, over a hundred yards rushing, a touchdown. He had some passing production. He seemed to be in sync with Nick Mullins. We don't know if Alexander Madison's going to come back from his ankle injury this week. We do know Ty Chandler will almost certainly be the 1A at this point. What can we tell people who, who got – who if you started Ty Chandler last week, you probably advanced in the fantasy playoffs. Now they play the Lions this week, have a tough run defense, a much weaker pass defense. What are realistic expectations for Ty Chandler with or without Alexander Madison in the lineup? Well, it, it was a good spot. I mean, the, the, the Bengals are a, a, an exceptionally poor rush defense. So I think the – the Vikings may have known that and may have hammered the run because of that. Clearly, clearly Ty Chandler is an upgrade over Madison. I do think that the return of Madison, I'm I I'm not gonna I'm not going to assume anything, you know, because teams like their running backs. They like their starting running backs, and it sometimes slash uh never really matters <laughs> uh if if the backup is better, if the RB2 is better, they're gonna say, oh, we we love Alexander, he's gonna get in there. And so I, I do think that Ty, Ty Chandler becomes like, like maybe a flex or maybe even a bench option if if Madison is back. I'm not I'm not going to assume that they're going to play Chandler way ahead of Madison. All right, and that's a shame to hear. I, I, uh, I mean, need him need him real 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 bad. But real but bad. Madison might not play. It, uh, there was a, there's also a, a little bit of concern. I mean, Chandler ran 17 routes on 41 dropbacks um, against against the Bengals. That's not that's not what we're looking for, you know. Four he four targets. He caught three passes on them at least, but yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 a couple of those were designed. So you know they clearly think that he has something, some juice in the passing game. But that that route rate kind of caught me caught my attention because I I was expecting, you know, like a I don't know 75 percent route rate and you know lots of little dump offs. Because Nick Mullins is is dump off king you know and, and we do like that we do and we do like taking a short break and then returning immediately after it unwrap an early christmas present this saturday with an nfl doubleheader it all begins at 3 p.m eastern as we take you up to kickoff in pittsburgh between the Bengals and steelers on nbc and peacock then at 7 30 it is a peacock exclusive matchup as josh allen and the bills look to stay in the postseason mix when they travel to los angeles to face the aforementioned los angeles Chargers. And don't forget, find all your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music. Just head to Amazon.com slash NBC Sports. We've talked an abnormal amount about this Peacock exclusive game, the Bills and Chargers, because there are it's it's hard to know like what is gonna happen. I do I just when I was reading the promo, I'm like, man, what if the Bills try to be legends and duplicate the I, Aiden O'Connell? <laughs> like oh, man. We, we want we want the Chargers to be the first team in NFL history to give up 60 in back to back games. I I they I mean it, it's a team that has like lost its soul. The, they, the, they really have. <laughs> they really, that's yeah. so, I had the dumbest like me style tweet ever during <laughs> that game where I tweeted that Brandon Staley Googled, can you fumble thy very soul? <laughs> and I'm dead serious. I wish I, had, I wish I had not tweeted this, but the, I had the same feeling you did. Like they have lost their soul. Did, did you tweet that? I really did. I'm not. <laughs> I really, I wish I were kidding. I mean, uh, it's true though. Like I've never seen a team that devoid of life. No, uh, that is, I mean, we're talking about the Raiders. Like this Raiders team stinks. They are terrible. Well, they've got a lot of soul. They have like so much soul. It's like ridiculous. And, and I respect. I do respect Antonio Pierce Pierce so much. 
for saying we're keeping our foot in the gas. You know, we're going cr- to crush these guys into dust. That dude was I, playing Madden. Like he was calling timeout. He, he, he was playing Madden. He I love Madden. it. Me I too. love it. Enough, enough, enough of this stuff of the, of the, of this, you know, good sportsmanship stuff. Give us the stats. Give us the yards. Keep scoring. Never relent. No, I could not agree more. Yeah. He gave us the stats. 63 points. The Las Vegas Raiders, the Chargers, uh, you need to look in the mirror. You need to look in the mirror and you need to do so exclusively on Peacock this Saturday evening. I'll be watching Josh Allen try to burn the house down. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully not literally, uh, because there's gonna be so many Bills fans there. So oh, like, oh my gosh. I bet half of half of Western New York, this is probably like their Christmas, like they yeah. like for Christmas this year, we're going to LA and watching the right. Bills. You're, right. We're, burn, we're gonna burn down yeah, SoFi Stadium. What the yeah. hell is that? Oh, I, it would it would be a nice uh, a nice little break from from Buffalo seeing that um the sun was down. At one o'clock in the in the afternoon. I know what was up with that game. I know, like <laughs> Jim Rand, Jim Nance, and Tony Rollins. It's just dark. Like wow. Oh, oh, oh wait, I'm sorry. It started at four. It started at four fifteen. But but I actually it was already saw... dark at four fifteen. It was already dark at four fifteen. No, like completely. But I actually saw a beat writer for the Bills tweeted a picture at like two o'clock, and it was actually nighttime. I'm not playing with you. <laughs> and the game is being played in Norway, uh, the That's, Arctic Circle. I don't know what it seems like. Uh, hey, uh, in other words, what I'm saying is, Buffalo folks, uh, take your vitamin D pills. The Bills are building their new stadium north of the Arctic Circle in Norway, by the way. Just put them in a dome. Is this thing? They're, I don't think they're building the dome. I think it is outdoors. No, they're because they're, they're not serious about winning. <laughs> if, they, if they were, they build a dome. Good God. <laughs> Good God. Uh, yeah, the Packers learned that lesson over and over again. All the all the outdoor field does is level the playing field, and that's why everybody always points to the Packers. Everybody always, but, oh, oh, I see what you're saying. But everybody always go, oh, oh, Brett, Brett Favre was good in the in the cold. Yeah, for like two games. I'm serious. That is why the Packers. The, how many times the Packers have now like they used to never lose at home. Now the past 20 years, I think they've set the record for like home playoff losses. Yeah. And it's because when it's five degrees, it just totally levels the playing field. If you can't feel your hands, it doesn't matter which team is better. And it's just fumble luck. Remember when the Michael Vick Falcons came in as double digit dogs oh, and yeah. won? They did burn the house down that night. That's what we need from the Bills against the Chargers on Saturday. What we need from the Jaguars, Denny, is Calvin Ridley to catch one pass. And I know that he did catch several passes actually on Sunday evening against the Ravens, but. My my thing with Calvin Ridley is is a non film bro watching this game. Like, dude, can this guy one one normal route? Can he just cut back in over the middle of the field and be open? Why every Calvin Ridley like, requires like five jukes, like five shoulder fakes. He's going in, he's going out. Like, let this man run one simple route and throw him one. the ball and get an easy catch. I've never seen anything like it. It, it. Why every okay yeah every every Calvin Ridley target. Is either with his toe tapping the sideline or the back line. No, uh, I've never, I've never seen him just catch a ball in the middle of the field like that. Oh, he like, did on the Falcons was catch and fall over the middle of the field. How is this not doable? He's Jaguars? a great catch and fall option. Yes. I don't understand how this is not. It'd be eighteen yards. He would catch it and fall from Matt Ryan. That's it. Would be amazing. How is this not doable for the Jacksonville Jaguars? It's yeah, it actually is driving me insane. I have him on my most important team, and I I'm gonna need I'm gonna need some points from old Cal because he's known as a route tactician. But my like this is ridiculous. Like the degree of difficulty doesn't need to be nine point nine on every Calvin Ridley route. But anyways, uh, Zay Jones yeah. hurt now. Zay Zay Jones and, it pro- probably I would guess probably out. You know, I mean, uh, no he oh he's uh, when when you're grabbing your hamstring before the the ref is even blowing the whistle mm-hmm, you're mm-hmm. not playing the following week. So Zay Jones yeah putting Christian Kirk on the sideline. What does it mean for Evan Ingram? What does it mean for Calvin yeah. Ridley? What does it mean for Parker Washington? So on and so forth. Yeah, so Parker Washington's role probably doesn't change a whole lot um, as as the slot guy. Ingram probably sees more targets. Ridley maybe sees more targets. I think. <laughs> Honestly, I'm looking at the route participation from last week, and uh, Jamal Agnew could be interesting. Um, he could, and, you know, for, for, I, he caught that long touchdown. Only saw two targets, but if he's forced into action, but the thing is, they they the Jags do like to put Tim Jones in there. I think because his name, last name is Jones, and they like to pretend that he's Zay. They just call him Zay. Hey Zay, You're like I'm not. I'm Tim. They've been uh, very and Jones is at wide it, 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 it um, actually. 
this is like three Jaguars coaching staffs that refuse to recognize that Jamal Agnew is really good. I know and it's crazy, it's insane. It's because he he wears thirty nine. It's his, I blame it on him. That's you can't be a receiver and wear thirty nine. It's the ugliest aesthetic in the history of the game. No, I'm not even kidding. I bet Trevor Lawrence, like, uh, what's the word? Uh, subliminally, when he yeah. sees thirty nine, he's like, I'm not throwing to the fullback. That's a corner. Well, they were a cornerback. I mean, yeah, 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 true. Yeah. So uh, if Jamal Agnew wore eighty, he he would be in the Pro Bowl this year. Um, wow. And uh, yeah, I so it could be could be him. Uh, you know, I will say uh, a dot wise. Um, you know, uh, Ridley and Say Jones had completely different. Uh, sorry, profiles. I'm getting all all sorts of mixed up here. Um, so I I do I do think that Parker Washington could take on some of those more intermediate targets. So yeah, interesting stuff going on with the Jaguars. Too interesting. They need to be less interesting. The Jaguars. Really interesting stuff with the Bucks. From Baker Mayfield again. He went into Lambeau. It wasn't cold this game. And put a 158.3 up in the Packers. A perfect QB rating. The mm. best start of his career by far. Chris Godwin's wife went on social media and was complaining about his role two weeks ago. And all of a sudden, they can't stop targeting him. It was his first 100-yard game of the entire season. Uh, Baker Mayfield has a very, very good Week 16 start for the fantasy playoffs. Someone you can point Chase with. I believe he's playing the Jacksonville Jaguars. I was correct. That's where this – I knew these tied in somehow. Uh, one of the ultimate pass funnels in the entire league. Yeah. Baker Mayfield, he's a QB1 for the fantasy semifinals. I think I'm ranked as the QB13 right now. It is, it is wild, but it's true. Um, yeah, Baker, I mean, look, the, the touchdowns are not going to be there quite like that going forward, but, uh, I, I like this sneaky kind of, um, uh, play volume based, uh, shootout potential of this Tampa Jacksonville game. Um, they, it's two pass funnels against each other. And often what happens when we get two pass funnels against each other, we run, we run lots of plays, Pat. So, um, we, we, we would like that also, uh, Jags are facing a 66% neutral pass rate over the wow. past six weeks. Uh, and uh, that, of course, didn't quite happen with the Ravens after I wrote them up in the uh, in the funnel report. Vinny, how many uh, catches does Zay Flowers have? Uh, we we looked into it. Uh, it looks like zero. It was one, but <laughs> <laughs> he caught one ball. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, he's back. He's back, folks. Well, you, yeah, as a longtime Zay Flowers hater, you... Nah, hey, just uh, he. I, I don't understand why everyone keeps ranking him as like a wide receiver two, or a wide receiver three, let alone a wide receiver two. But I digress. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Baker Mayfield. Uh, you're you're starting. I mean, who who? So I actually okay. I'm not you know, not playing. I don't even know if this is bold. You can tell me. You can slap me down if if this is too bold. I am fairly easily playing Baker Mayfield over Jordan Love this week. I haven't ranked two spots ahead of Jordan Love. And Jordan Love, it's just been too much of a high wire act without Christian Watson, where he did get home against the Bucks, but it's not as easy for him with Christian Watson without Christian Watson. And like if, if you, I feel like you're gonna be sweating Jordan Love until like the final few minutes of the game, basically. So he's not a horrible option this week. He's right on the periphery too. I have Baker QB eleven, actually. Jordan Love QB thirteen, but I'm playing Baker over Jordan Love for sure. Uh who else might be might be kind of if Let me ask had... you: Are you playing Baker Mayfield or Trevor Lawrence in the game where they're facing oh. each other? Wow, that's a good that's a good question. Uh, Lawrence, I have had Trevor Lawrence like five different spots in my rankings this week so far. He's just had such a bad year. They're so banged up. It is a must win. They're gonna have to pass a lot. They are gonna Trevor, pass a lot. Trevor Lawrence is a really week sixteen wild card. We do play. Baker Mayfield or hopefully a returning CJ Stroud against the Cleveland Browns, probably without Nico Collins again. Yeah, Mayfield. I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't place I wouldn't put Stroud in the top 15 this week. I have Stroud right at 15, which I can't decide on. Two more, and then one we're gonna segue into our next segment. Gardner Minshew in Atlanta, mm-hmm. as you mentioned, where even even the Jaguars might have fans on the road for this one. <laughs> Come on, fine. you said it, not me. Jeez. Yeah, yeah, you're the one. Oh, so relax. The problem <laughs> yeah. fans are suffering enough. Yeah, but so Gardner Minshew in Atlanta or Baker Mayfield at home um, against the Jaguars. Uh, Mayfield, Mayfield. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, well, yeah, Minshew, of course, lots riding on whether or not Michael Pittman plays. You were telling me off air you thought Michael Pittman was out. I'm telling you, they're throwing him out there. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of like. 
a guess that people are like, yeah, he'll be fine. He'll be, he'll no, be he fine. won't be fine. They're going to play him is the point, though. <laughs> he, oh, okay. I, I there's, been, there's been some serious – this is just a theory, but there's been some serious backsliding on the NFL concussion. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, they took it really seriously for a while. But I, every week I'm seeing someone who's obviously concussed just playing, including Trevor Lawrence Sunday night. Well, we had two, yeah, back to back games where, uh, primetime games where you have uh, uh, a Watt. TJ Watt. Yeah. TJ Watt clearly suffered a concussion. He was having trouble, obviously, with, I mean, you knew this watching the game. You Couldn't knew focus. That. Yeah. We, he was having trouble with, with uh, light sensitivity, right? And so they gave him a dark visor and they were like, get him, get back in there. Like, I, I, I just, yeah, they're major backsliding. Uh, Trevor Lawrence clearly Very needed to come great. out of the game after having his head dribbled off the turf. Um, so, yeah, th- I don't know what's what's going on. A- after the Tua thing, which is very scary, um, you know, the league kind of got serious about it. And now we're going to have to have another, like, very concerning, frightening situation in order to get teams back in line. There's been several times, too, where there, there was like a 10-second concussion evaluation. <laughs> like, they yeah. went out for it and they missed, like, one play. Like, uh, what, what's your name? What's your name, CJ Stroud? Um, CJ? Right. <laughs> Get back in there. Uh, well, uh, and I, I do think partly it comes down to like teams will say, well, he's fine. He said he was fine. Um, you have to you have to ignore the player. Yes. Yes. I think I think that that's what I've read in, in, in the analysis, like the medical analysis of concussion evaluation. You cannot just go by the the athlete saying, "Yes, I'm I'm okay." You can't no, do you that. Cannot. No, anyway. you cannot. So the final one was going to be Baker Mayfield against the Jaguars or Jake Browning against the Steelers. But first, let's just talk about Jake Browning against the Steelers, because uh, like you pointed out, he was going nowhere for three quarters against Brian Flores and the Vikings. Then went absolutely ballistic in that final corner quarter. And was one of the very best streamers the first week of the fantasy playoffs. But it's a different setup for Week 16. Uh, it's a tough-ish matchup at the Steelers. The Steelers' defense has been kind of speaking backsliding, kind of backsliding, but it seems like he's going to be without Jamar Chase and the shoulder injury. And Jake Browning, now one of the most shocking, surprising three-game stretches of quarterback play in like recent NFL history, like truly would have never seen this coming. But what do you think the outlook is for Jake Browning? Probably without Jamar Chase, and would you start Jake Browning in Pittsburgh? Or Baker Mayfield against the Jaguars. Hey, Baker, just to get that out of the way. I'm sorry, Baker. I mean, it, it's it's going to be an ugly uh, environment uh, between the Steelers and and Bengals. I mean, you have Mason Rudolph starting for the um, uh, for the Steelers, which is just uh, remarkable. A, per Kyle Dvorak, that is a giga yikes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what all the kids are saying. Uh, you know, yeah, he's still getting away with it. Um, tons of yak. Uh, <laughs> You know, sorry, I didn't know. <laughs> for me to laughed at yak, <laughs> tons of yak, and and uh, you know, good for good for the slappies. I, I, I'm happy for the slappies who got away with it again. Uh, Browning, you don't, you don't sound too happy. Um, oh, I'm so I'm thrilled. Uh, <laughs> I was so right headed into the fourth quarter against the Vikings, and then I went to a Christmas party, Pat, and then oh, yeah. I started getting uh, tweets i started getting replies saying where's your god now and i thought no, I, i've been no joke getting online jake browning hate mail which i have i don't get that stuff as much as i used to people have been mad at me for truthing jake browning dude well, didn't didn't someone say the only reason that you expressed some skepticism toward him is because you lost to him in fantasy yeah i can't remember so i mean off, no one was playing him that, so i just right. i didn't lose to him uh, and and also that's not i mean i don't know if we're if we're you know pulling back the curtain here not how this works no we don't we don't base our analysis off of our our hurt feelings about (laughs) there's only one player and it's calvin ridley but other than that obviously obviously and you can tell by the bitter blurbs that we post yes yes Uh, cal do something with your life (laughs) in the nfl and playing pretty well by any reasonable standard sorry it's not just necessarily translating to fantasy points and very chastened i never log back on ever again in my life (laughs) After <laughs> Calvin Ridley says this to me, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Did you have anything more to say about Jake? Yeah, Browning? Browning. I mean, uh, please just just don't start Jake Browning. You got to do something better. Don't start Jake Browning. Are you starting Joe Flacco in Houston or yeah. Baker Mayfield against the Jaguars? Flacco, Flacco, Flacco. I'm going Flacco too. I have got a two QB league where I had Justin Herbert. We got home with Aiden O'Connell last week. Now we're trying to get home with Joe Flacco this week. You can do it. Oh, it can happen. I'm feeling very good. I will be honest. Yeah. 
Very, very, very good. And with uh, alongside a young man by the name of Tua Tunga Valoa. So really, really hoping Tua. Can Tua honest? Can Tua have a high scoring game like once ever? Well, like the Dolphins, they, the Dolphins are the classic. They're too good when they're good. Like, give me some fantasy points, my God! The Dolphins, right, the Dolphins are committed to just shutting it down once they've scored some points. And I, you know, I, I'm a little surprised because Mike McDaniel doesn't seem like that kind of coach. <laughs> well, they, but... they don't ever let Tua throw in the red zone. I, mean, I haven't looked this up, but like Tua, they just think it's gonna be an instant interception in the red zone, so they're running yeah. no matter what inside the ten yard line. Let's see, we have, yeah, actually, the Dolphins are are fairly run kind of in the middle of the league and in, in red zone pass rate. I, you know, I, I, I do. I think it's a thing where like you got to hope that your dolphins get there big time before it's a blowout because a, it doesn't work the other way around. Okay. It doesn't work where the dolphins fall behind and Tua has a big game. Once they fall behind, it's He's pretty much night. over. He's taking giga sacks. Once they fall behind, we also have an issue, Pat, where by many metrics, Miami's past defense since Jalen Ramsey has come back is elite is like I at know. the top of the league. It's That's a bad. problem. That's it's a bad. problem for fantasy. This is almost as bad as the chiefs defense being good. Right. Uh, we, so we, we're not, we're not going to get those back and forth games with dolphins no. uh, mo- uh, almost ever with this, with this kind of pass defense. They got Jan Ramsey shadowing people again. It's real bad. It's real. Oh, real oh, bad. It's, oh it's horrible. I, he shadowed I, Garrett Wilson. I wish one good offense had a, a bad. Well, the Eagles. So the Eagles what happened? Now they have a bad offense, though. No, no, they don't. They just have a confused and and backwards looking offense. They're trying to do what they did last year, and they it can't, it can't work when your defense is getting shredded by Drew Locke. The, the Zoomers won't remember that every good fantasy offense used to have a bad defense. Um, they, all, they all used to be the Lions. Yeah. Every team they'd have a bad defense with the good offense. That's what you're supposed to do. That's how you're supposed to do it. Be nice. uh, should we talk about the Steelers and Commanders, or should we just end the show? I think we should, we probably should end it. It, it. Nothing really changed in the Steelers uh, backfield. It's still, it's still just kind of frustrating. Uh, just real quick for the commanders, you have um, only four rushing attempts for Antonio Gibson. Chris uh, Rodriguez had 10 and functioned basically as the, as the early down, like between the twenties banger. So there's not, there's not a whole lot uh, there. As far as receiving goes, uh, Antonio Gibson uh, ran 18 routes to, uh, what's his name? Um, Chris Rodriguez. Right, Rodriguez. Um, I don't believe he logged a pass route. No, so, that's not really his thing. Um, yeah. So Jonathan Williams actually ran eight pass routes to Antonio Gibson's eighteen. Uh, Gibson saw five targets. It's, it's it's exactly what we thought it would be. And you remember Jarrett Patterson? I wonder where he is. He's on the Chargers. What in the world? I was I thinking know. of a random pass catching Commanders backs. And I thought of our guy, Jarrett Patterson. I assumed he was out of the league. He's on the Chargers. Wow. They should maybe um, play him. They should maybe play him. Maybe they will this weekend on NBC and Peacock exclusively Saturday evening. I will be watching. Not a bit. Will be watching because uh, I watch every single game. because I love the NFL, even when they don't score, which has been all the time this year. But I'll be watching. Uh, hopefully, fun. hopefully you'll be listening to our preview show that we have on Thursday with Kyle. Hopefully you're reading everything we have on the site including Denny's regression files on Wednesday, my rankings on Thursday. Uh, So for Denny Carter, I'm Patrick Darty, wishing you happy holidays and telling you we'll see you again on Thursday.